Hi, welcome to the All Things LGBTQ interview show, where we interview LGBTQ guests who are making important contributions to our communities. All Things LGBTQ is taped at Orca Media in Montpelier, Vermont, which we recognize as being unceded indigenous land. Thanks for joining us and enjoy the show. As we reported on a recent episode of All Things LGBTQ, there has been a change at the Pride Center of Vermont. And the Pride Center has hired a new director of their health and wellness program. But it's somebody who's known to us <laughs> and who makes us smile. So we wanted to take this opportunity to invite Kel back to the program to talk about their move into this new position. So welcome, Kel. Thanks so much, Keith, for having me back. It's so fun to come back and chat and bring a little Central Vermont to the Pride Center. Oh, okay. So don't don't lose don't that in. thought. <laughs> yeah, because we're we're gonna come back to that. So looking at the Pride Center's announcement. There, Mike Bensel's comments indicated that you had already been working basically in this program and on a part-time basis, and you were moving up, and they were excited about this. So what made this the best move for you at this point in time? Totally. It was a unique moment in time uh, last winter when the Pride Center was going to start rolling out the at-home HIV testing, and we had so few testers in the mix. We are down with HIV testers in general. We've had a lot of staff just turn over naturally, and then we're in a pandemic without training. So there was a moment where the Pride Center hired me on a, in a part-time basis to basically go do the same job I was doing at Vermont Cares, being an HIV tester at the Pride Center. So it was a really cool uh, way for me to straddle the fence and also dip in and help support the social groups. And I just, it's, I've always done peer-based work and I knew there would be a point I've applied at the Pride Center in past positions. And it's like one of those moments where you hope as a queer kid, like someday I'm going to work with all these queer, amazing coworkers. And it helped me lean into that decision being part-time for that year. And then it's, as there's been some transition at CARES, it just was feeling like the work that I'm really jazzed up about doing has to have this social component. And wow, has that been so effective? And this is like part of my core being, all this art and social outreach that's not part of the work at CARE. So it was like, oh, that's the Pride Center's work is always the message. So it was always like, okay, well, I'll just do it on my own. Um, and then the moment came up when I could leap to the team and then the director opening opened up and I love to be in the back burner, helping other people have the structure they need to succeed and do the work. So for me, it's nice to be able to be in the background a bit and out front, I'm, I'm a front of house kid. Very gregarious. I was going to say, in my conversation with Taylor Small about your moving into this position, and she was so excited you were moving into it, Taylor shared that you really like to do prevention outreach and being proactive. So could you talk a little bit about how that's going to fold into the work of health and wellness or, or how that skill is going to benefit the programs and what we might see coming forward with Kel as the director of this program. It's such a treat to carry the lineage from Taylor to, to be uh, T for T across that um, little moment in time. And we have such a similar uh, perspective and gauge and come from really different perspectives. So it is going to be really exciting to continue on so much of the great work that Taylor and the team have done. For me, I love participatory education. So having events that bring us joy and pleasure that we can also connect to resources and 
um, that warm relationship building relationships are how we make our most effective referrals. So whether that's happening over an HIV testing or happening at a social or a support group, we are building trust with people one-on-one. -on -one and that, for me, that's part of the prevention is building trust with people that have been left in the margins, that we've fallen through all the holes in the nets and here we are traumatized and triggered. So these are our chosen family, a lot of the rainbow times and to be able to go out and envision a world where we're not waiting for somebody to be at high risk for HIV to help them understand sexual health risk. So for me, I see most of our preventative, what we would call preventative, we're already reacting to high risk behavior. We're putting band-aids on where that's not prevention, that's reaction, right? Because we need to get the folks before they're in a high risk situation. Meth is a great example of a substance that has a same with heroin. They have very short windows where when you're using, if you're at risk to become dependent, you're at risk in a really small window and have the potential to slide really fast. And we know with meth that there's a sexual inhibition that a um, guy might play across sexuality lines, even though they might not identify that way. So we want to get to folks before they're using meth, right? Which means we might get to them when they're drinking alcohol or exploring whatever. So more holistic, uh, joy-based containers that bring the both end of the health and the wellness. Okay, so building off what you just shared, can you talk about some of the specific programs and outreach that the Health and Wealth Miss Program are already offering and maybe a little detail about them so we might entice people that they might want to attend or participate? Totally. Shameless promotion moment. Um, so our health and wellness program at the Pride Center of Vermont has three programs within us where the GLAM program is the gay, bi, trans guys. It's really like who's at risk for HIV and we're a social group for gay, bi, trans guys. So we do weekly social events. We do a monthly sex chat where we dig into high risk topics and create a space for us to unpack this risk and build peer prevention networks where hopefully folks will attend the groups and then go tell five friends about what they've learned. It's partially why I made the HIVM prep comic pamphlets that it's about starting conversation. It's not just about moving information. So for me, those are like education things, right? Knowledge has to be useful to the person. So you'll also see us coming out, out more. We know that HIV testing is getting harder to do with the amount of overdose prevention that's needed right now out of our incredible small teams doing the overdose and syringe support program in the state. So for my coworkers and I to be able to <clears throat> go out and do supplementary HIV testing, be that warm handoff is we have to get out of Burlington to be able to hit some of those high risk areas and support getting more testing out. Those are also places that don't have the queer savvy health providers all the time. So we extra need to get out to create those access points and then helping people know that there's also these social groups. A lot of our groups are still happening online. Um, so that's glam, sort of like we run the HIV testing. We send folks safer sex supplies across the state if you need say for sex barriers, lube, we'll put it right in the mail to you. You can make a request right online. We have at-home HIV testing for anybody that needs HIV testing. We are not, um, we don't have to screen people really hard on identity for that. You reach out, you let us know you need a test. There's a survey, we send it to your door. We do a virtual session or an over the phone if you want it. Some people don't want that, but if you do, and then we help refer you depending on results. If there's other stuff you want, like more STI testing, which we're increasing the ability to make that free for Vermonters if they need STI testing. That's been a huge gap with PrEP. We've been able to, for some years now, been able to make the medication free, but not the three to four times a year that you need to go get STI screenings. Those lab fees get up into the upper hundreds to thousands. Now we can really help people get affordable, low to no pay 
screening and care um, with Planned Parenthood and some of the providers. So that's a really exciting new thing. Um, so that's one part of our umbrella. And then we have the QD BIPOC program Thrive, which is specifically how do we help build and bridge and connect our QD BIPOC community thank the goddess that they live here and how do we like create safer containers that they might truly thrive. So they're a huge um, perspective part of our program. My coworker Richard and a couple of our board members are uh, involved with that program. And then GLOW, the Women and Women Aligned program, they do um, a lot of uh, cervical cancer, breast screening, heart health, like specific uh, connection with folks, and then do social groups like pride hikes or super popular events. We'll have dog walks, coffee shop nights. They do movie nights. We're going to do a bunch of speed friending events virtually through the spring so that some can be program demographic specific and then just a pride center wide one that we can all just meet each other we need more of that too it's like everybody is asking <laughs> you know how do we break down the silos and or where do i fit as a non-binary trans identified person my gender shows up differently what group do i fit in so breaking down, unpacking some of that, again, making risk a skill up. How do we help people assess risk better for themselves? And I could access all of these by going onto the Pride Center website or the Facebook yep. page or signing up for the monthly newsletter yep. that Justin has been sending out. Exactly. And I use our calendar at the Pride Center. When I do queer events that are not uh, center run, I put them on that calendar. So there's stuff that it's all of our groups and it's stuff statewide. So I think that's a, a really great role for the Pride Center as part of what we do. We run the big Pride Fest, but also just having a platform to cross pollinate. So with our remaining time, <laughs> you were as clearly establishing yourself as an organizer, an innovator, and an activist in central Vermont. You have kind of alluded to the Pride Center maybe inching out a little bit more out of Burlington. So are we going to see a continuation of some of the central Vermont outreach that you've already spoiled us with? Definitely. You're definitely going to see um, more street-based stuff, and then also some more formalized larger events. Elaine Ball and um, some community folks, including me, are talking about a, a Montpelier-based pride for June 3, 4, 5, somewhere in that catchment. I have already booked the Barry Old Labor Hall for um, a double drag feature showcase evening of both the Vermont Drag Idol and the Central Vermont Drag Ball. So we'll do a drag pop-up with workshops and resources all day. We'll have the um, youth-friendly uh, amateur contest as the pre first round, and then we'll do the uh, saucier <laughs> adult version, <laughs> mature audience. Um, and that's June 11th. So the first two weekends in June, then we go into Juneteenth. And then there's already talk of Bethel doing a Pride at the end of June, potentially. And um, Burlington People's Pride, I bet, will happen again, too, this year. I would be, I'd be surprised. And we're moving back to the waterfront, our, our Pride in Burlington. So I don't know if the kitten's officially out of the bag on that. So don't quote me. Um, but yeah, I, I, I didn't hear a thing. No, you didn't hear a thing. But yes, me being in central Vermont, I think that was a helpful hook. Like I'm HIV positive. That's a hook. I'm a trans person. Like that, that's something that we get, right? So having all these networked communities, I want to both help merge some of that with the center and some of that's not mergeable because it's, you know, different type of work. So I'm excited for more collaboration. I'm excited for more of like, how can the center, we don't have to run everything. How do we help lift up and support all these other community prides that are popping up? It's incredible and gives me a place to go do HIV testing. So it's really a win, <laughs> win, win. And with that, I, I just want to thank you and acknowledge what an absolute treasure you are and how fortunate our communities are to have you here. 
and your level of activism. And I'm gonna do an invitation now for you to come back for us just to talk about prevention and yes. not just, oh, you need to do things to keep yourself safe. We're gonna talk the real talk about this is what you need to do and this is how you do it. So with that, thank you. Thanks so much, Keith, always a pleasure. Hi, everybody. I'd like to introduce uh, Maya Kasten Kastengay. Is that right? Yes. Okay, good. Um, and she is, I believe, co-owner and worker at Ralbo Rouse's here in Montpelier, Vermont. If you haven't been, it's a really fun place. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved in this project. Yeah, so um, my name is Maya Castingay. Um, I am 19 uh, and I'm a co-owner at Rabble Rouser. I'm also the shop team lead and uh, I also do accounts payable. I run the facilities team. Uh, I wear many hats, but mostly uh, my main roles are as, as co-owner and as the shop team lead. Um, and yeah, so I'm 19, I live in Waterbury, I've got a dog, um, and, uh, yeah, that's, that's basically, that's me. So did somebody like walk up to you and say, Hey, you want to be an investor in this project we're thinking about? I mean, how did this happen for you? So, um, yeah, so when I was in high school, I went to U32 um, and I did the branching out program. Um, and that kind of got me into doing a business management internship. Um, and like during high school, my big focus was like trying to learn how to run a business, but I never wanted to go to college. Um, so I really, really wanted to learn about like how to run a business without spending a ton of money on college. Um, so what I did, I took a business management internship um, and with Rebel Rouser, and um, I was hired on to uh, be on the shop team for uh, opening the, the Montpelier space. Um, we had a space in Middlesex uh, when we were called Nutty Steps. Um, we had a space in Middlesex, and in um, August of 2019, we decided to expand and have a second location here in Montpelier. Um, so I was hired on as uh, one of the first shop team members here. Um, and since we're a worker owned co-op, we have a, uh, it's called the rising owner journey. Um, and so you spend uh, a year and a half uh, learning like the inner workings of the business, learning how um, uh, the financials every month we do a financial review um, of, you know, all of our, um, all the money we made, all the money we spent, everything like that, learning just how to run the business. Um, in that year and a half process, uh, the current owners will elect the rising owners to um, become an owner and you do a buy-in and all of that. So that's kind of how I uh, became an owner here. Um, and yeah, so, but it all started with a, a business management internship. That's great. And it's great yeah. that you, it's great to know, to that you knew what to do at such a young age. I mean, to know that that's what you wanted and, and you were going to go for it. So you really need to be applauded for that. I mean, <laughs> thank you. you know, it's, it's a young age to, to figure all that out. Most people don't figure it out till their thirties. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that's good. Um, and <clears throat> so you opened and then the pandemic hit. Yes. Yep. That was tough. That was tough. Um, a two year pandemic. Yeah, that was tough. Um, you know, in a way I'm kind of grateful for the pandemic in a sense that it gave us a chance to like stop and look at what we're doing, what's working, what's not working. And then as we like slowly reopen, we could grow on the techniques that were working and find new techniques. Um, and it's really helped us grow. Um, but yeah, so beginning of the pandemic, we shut down the, uh, the, we shut down both locations. Um, and then shortly after we just, uh, closed down the middle sex location. Um, so now we're like totally out of, uh, the Montpelier space. Um, 
and we were closed down for like um about it was like six or seven months um and we were doing luckily we have a good um web sales and wholesale base um so that was really helpful you know through those beginning months um and then in about june yeah i think it was june uh we opened up like this little lemonade stand kind of thing in our front doorway um and we were selling coffee drinks uh shaken uh shaken cold brew drinks um in our mason jars um and that like really helped to build our like in-person uh base back and like in our we have pretty big windows and we would have like our products displayed and we called it curbside shopping so you'd uh, pick out what you want from the window and we'd go inside grab it for you and then that's how you would do your shopping for a while yeah i remember that it was uh it was pretty interesting and um, yeah and i love your space i mean it's so big and airy and and comfortable uh I, yeah it's really a nice space so uh, i imagine once this pandemic's open that you'll probably have i know you have a sunday irish band that plays there usually right on sunday afternoon yep. i have a friend who plays there and um i imagine as the pandemic wanes hopefully it will um that you'll have more activities in there like poetry readings music i mean it's a great space for that so yeah yeah definitely definitely um we so pre-pandemic we had we had a stage that like people play music on and we actually turned that into our like designated packaging area right now um so we have some like spatial things to figure out for like music and stuff but we're definitely looking into like getting back into that um and just like activities in general we're really excited to bring back and so you foresee your future as like just sort of stabilizing uh this place and getting it working the way you want do you have any idea about wanting to open other places uh other stores it's, yeah i mean it's definitely a possibility we've you know we've considered it um at the moment like with the pandemic we're not really ready to do it just yet but it's definitely a we're, something we're considering um for, for the future I would think it would be a big draw in Burlington or Brattleboro or, you know, anywhere. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, and the nice thing about having, like, the, the number of owners that we have, we have six owners, is that, you know, we can send some owners to, like, a new location, begin a new location, and still have owners here. Yeah, people who know how to run the store and can train. Um, yep. Yeah. So, um, if you, I don't know, like I would think some places that don't even have good coffee shops or good places for people to go would also be an attraction if they were close to big cities or the bigger cities. Um, so what do you see yourself doing in the future? Are you just gonna kind of hang with the, the business and, uh, keep moving forward and moving up and yeah yeah um i i definitely see that for myself you know it was always a dream of mine when i was a kid like i wanted to be a business owner um you know previously i was i wanted to own a restaurant i wanted to be a chef you know all that stuff i don't want to be a chef anymore i i have i don't like cooking as much as i used to um but i but the business owner was always the same um so you know i yeah i mean i really love what i do i love working with all the people that i get to meet here um training new co-workers and just like all the people that i get to see here um so i mean i just can't wait to just stick with the business watch it grow um and just really see where we can take this place and you know the other thing that i noticed and i really liked was um that you have a lot of uh, local artwork. Uh, you have a lot of local vendors that sell out of the store. Uh, and you have sort of progressive politics by what I've noticed, how you post and what you post. Yes, so, yes. You know, uh, so that's really uh, an important thing, I think. 
uh, at least it is for me. When I go there, I feel like, okay, you know, I'm with my people. You know? Yes, yes, yeah, for sure. You know, and that's important, uh, I think, for a certain demographic anyway. It is for me. So, um, and you have food. Limited, yep. I know, but you have some. And that you offer we do, yep. And you offer it to people on the sliding scale, which is really kind of nice. That if people yeah. have a lot of money, they can come in and pay what they can and and get lunch. I mean, that's really good, you know? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and who decided these things? I mean, was it like something you decided as a group? Like, okay, you know, we're progressive. We're going to hire people um, with that in mind. Uh, and also about the food. And I mean, was this like a group decision that you made to... Yeah, so actually a lot of the decisions that we make are um, in in the teams. Uh, we do something called integrative consensus. Uh, so in our meetings, we bring proposals and there's one facilitator um, and there's no like set agenda to the meeting when we come into it. Um, and we all can surface our proposals and that's the agenda. The agenda is like all the proposals that everybody in the meeting um, brings. Um, so like, for example, when we have our shop team meeting, it's all of our shop workers um, and we all can surface our own proposals. Um, and then, you know, we'll star the agenda and, um, you know, whatever has the most stars gets utilized by the facilitator to try and pick which ones um, that we're going to talk about in the allotted time that we have. Um, and then, you know, once somebody makes a proposal, um, we'll all have a chance to give questions and comments and then to uh, consent or object to the proposal. And if we see that the proposal would do harm to the company, we can object. Um, but if not, then um, it goes through consensus. Um, and those are like for things that are like outside of someone's role. Um, and each role has set accountabilities and everything like that. So it's very like transparent across the board. Like everybody has kind of a say, there's no like one big manager that does everything. Um, so when we were, for example, for specifically the, um, the pay what you can sliding scale thing, uh, when we first opened the shop up again uh, after the pandemic, uh, like when we we're doing that little lemonade stand thing, um, we, uh, the shop team was, it was only like four people at the time. Now we're about 14, 15 people. Um, but we, it was a proposal that was made and, you know, we all came up with, you know, how we're going to do this, how we're going to process everything. And then we all, you know, as a group consented to it. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's how we make all of our decisions. And uh, in, that, in that particular instance, that's, that's how we made that decision to have the sliding scale um, approach. Do you ever have anybody, I know you have a mask policy. Have you ever had a hassle with anybody coming in there? No, I'm asking. A little bit, a little bit. You know, once in a while we get people who don't want to wear them, um, but you know, they're mostly respectful, you know, a couple of days ago, I had someone, I said, you know, masks are required in the store. We have some over there for you. And they were like, nope, I'm not wearing it. Goodbye. And then I just walked out. So, I mean, that's how it usually goes. It's, it's not usually too big of a hassle. Um, but yeah, it, it happens once in a while, but usually people are really good about it. Well, I, I really personally appreciate your uh, vision there. So, um, is there anything you would like the audience to know besides go there, spend money? <laughs> um, <laughs> if people wanted to apply for a job, would they just walk in and say, you know, hey, I, this is a cool place. I'd like to work here. Yeah, yeah. People can do that. A lot of people end up doing that. And um, I always just forward them to our, our email that fields all resumes and everything like that. And uh, yeah, it's a really welcoming place to work. Um, we have a really diverse crowd here. Um, a lot of people, you know, like English isn't their first language and we're just really accepting of all of that. And really we work to help each other out and that ends up helping the business out. So, um, but yeah, we're, we're a really diverse crowd here. Um, and 
yeah, I mean, just come and come and see the place, the variety of things that we have. Half of the store is like jewelry and art and the other half is coffee and chocolate. Um, and it's really like all that you would want, especially for gifts, is a real great place to get gifts. Um, you no, know, I saw things yeah. disappearing off the rack. You know, it was like, first you had this display and then there were none and then there was a new display so oh yeah yeah especially during christmas time christmas time yeah. is super busy for us yeah well that's good that's what a lot of people catch up on what they had made during the year so um okay well thank you so much for being on the show and absolutely thank you for having me and everybody go over to rabble rousers and buy uh uh what is it a uh, uh chocolate vaginas or chocolate yeah <laughs> the vulvas the yeah, vulvas yeah. have a vulva have a specialty <laughs> mocha everything like that <laughs> so go over and buy yourself one or buy one yeah. for a friend thank you so much for coming and we'll see you uh soon yes thank you linda buddy i'm here with ann mcguire uh longtime activist a writer, uh, even though um, she links her activism and her writing fairly directly, um, a member of a current activist group called Revolting Lesbians, which is a direct action group um, that has been operating and doing a lot of exciting things in the New York area and uh, in the past internationally. Um, Anne is the author of Rock the Sham, a 2006 volume about the Irish um, LGBT movement to um, be part of the St. Patrick's Day Parade in New, in New York. And that was an ongoing 10 year struggle to achieve that. 20? 25 year struggle. Really? Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Anne hails from Ireland. So let me start by asking you when you came to the US and how you became, how you happened to become an activist. Okay, I came here in October 1987 and um, I was already an activist, um, not heavily around lesbian issues, much more to do with them. Um, uh, reproductive rights in Ireland, women in prison, especially um, Republican or nationalist women in the north of Ireland in prison, and uh, the anti-abortion campaign that has been recently overturned. Um, so I was involved in the campaign when uh, it was actually inserted into the constitution that abortion would be illegal but that has been changed and I, I think I became an activist for many reasons. I grew up in a city that was very politically active when I came of age. Um, my grandmother told me fantastic stories about living through the um, Easter Rising in 1916 in Dublin and also through the Civil War and the War of Independence and losing a brother during that. And also my grandfather, her husband, who refused to speak about any of that, um, was in the Irish Republican Army, the, as he called it, the old IRA. Um, so I had her stories and a sense that, you know, she was just an ordinary woman could live through such incredible historic moments in her own little area of Dublin in this really small little country. Um, and then, as I say, I, I grew up uh, in my teens and um, early adulthood uh, during a time in Ireland that a lot of stuff was going on. So it's not a natural move but it was one I took for some reason and I can't really tell you why I just did yeah and then you moved to the U.S. in 1987 yeah um, and sometime along on this timeline you came out as a lesbian yeah I, I came out as a lesbian in Ireland um I mean my friends people I worked with um 
um, my family knew that I was a lesbian already. And um, I came here and, you know, went to ACT UP meetings. Uh, I mean, coming here was a massive uh, cultural shock, even though I'm from a, a Western country, Ireland was like so completely different to New York, never mind America. And I, I think the first several years here, um, I was really adjusting and looking, looking for where I could fit in and find my people and, you know, do my work. Um, so it wasn't really until uh, the Irish Lesbian and Gay Organization was formed a few years later that um, I found where I could do some good activist work in, in New York. What brought you to New York? Uh, I wanted to get out of Ireland. Um, it was horrifying for a young woman growing up there, the misogyny, um, which was state sanctioned, um, church sanctioned. It was just everywhere. And there were several, there was the anti-abortion amendment campaign. Um, there was a horrible um, public, trial of a woman who had given birth to a, 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 a child that was stillborn, but the state decided um, to prosecute her for another, the body of another child that was found and it, it ended up in, in, in being like a public trial of Irish womanhood. Women were getting fired from jobs as teachers because they were having affairs with with men who were separated um, and, and girls I mean one girl and lovers um, who had been pregnant and hid it died in the grotto of a church along with the child who, where she went to give birth to the child on her own and I think that just completely broke my heart. And I thought, I need to get out of this place. It's so toxic. And, and I came to America. So <laughs> go figure. <laughs> and then you joined the, you were one of the founders of the Lesbian Avengers, but you before that you were involved in ACT UP? Yes, I mean, I went to ACT UP meetings, I, I went to a lot of their actions, um, but I was, uh, I found ACT UP very intimidating. And I mean, that was part of the culture shock. I, I believed when I came here that I was a lesbian of the world, I was very comfortable with who I was. And I got to ACT UP and it was like, oh my God, I, I don't know the half of it. I, I didn't recognize um, myself in these, uh, you know, gay men and lesbians who were so confident, so ferocious, fierce. And, you know, I, I realized I had a lot of work to do uh, on, on that level, which was, you know, it was good for me. It was good for me to learn that, yeah. And then you were founder of the Avengers. And, you know, from what I've learned, that was a group of women who um, got together to make something happen. Absolutely. That, you know, the Avengers were formed in uh, 1992, I believe. And um, so I had been here since, you know, Five almost five years and um, also I had been involved in the Irish lesbian and gay organization for a couple of years and that um, I, I mean I had to grow up very quickly as an activist and um, because of that uh, and was also introduced a lot more to a lot of you know the New York activists that I wouldn't have known um, city politics the archdiocese um, uh, and the law, and um, I was much more comfortable in New York and much more comfortable um, in where, where I could fit in. So the Lesbian Avengers was absolutely perfect timing at that time for, for me to, you know, you know, get involved in. So yeah, that was perfect timing. 
Well, can you talk a little about the Irish Gay and Lesbian Organization since they, you uh, were part of that before the Avengers in your first five years or so? Yeah, um, I mean, we, we came together because um, there, was not the, there was a lot of Irish people in New York uh, coming from, you know, early 80s all the way through into the 90s, a lot of mostly undocumented and uh, a huge amount uh, of gay people who were fleeing Ireland, um, but completely closeted, still completely closeted here. But, you know, uh, an, we saw an ad in an Irish newspaper here saying, you know, there are gay Irish people here and we'd kind of like to meet. So um, when the, the very first meeting of the group, 19 gay men showed up and myself and my partner, Marie, we were the only two lesbians. <laughs> and we won our first battle in that meeting by naming the group. So naming the group as exactly who we were for a start and not a Gaelic name. Some people were pushing a Gaelic name, which was Cordia, which means friends. And myself and Marie were going, but nobody will know what that means. So nobody will know who we are. And uh, so we had that battle and then we wanted lesbian to go first. And we said it needs to be, there are only two of us here. Look at all you men, lesbian is going first. We want lesbians to know that they're, that they're um, very welcome here and it's for lesbians as well. So, I mean, the fact that both myself and Marie had some political activist experience, you know, we actually could go in and win our very first battle at the founding meeting. <laughs> yeah, so we're very proud of that. And from there, we marched in the Gay Pride Parade. We were only about four months in existence. And it was our reception in that. So people thought it was really, really amusing to see a banner that identified us as Irish gays. And they were saying things like, oh my God, there is no such thing. Is this a joke? And um, this is so funny. And I think it was the meeting after that, we thought if the gay community doesn't think we exist, the Irish community has to be even worse. And what about marching in the St. Patrick's Day Parade? And um, okay, and the, uh, the result is that, you know, we were turned down, it was completely homophobic, and it took 25 years for them to allow an Irish gay group march in the parade, a quarter of a century. It's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. But it's testimony to your um, stick to itiveness, to your steadfast persistence in the face of opposition. How many members were there by the time you achieved the uh, goal of march being able to march in the parade? Well, by then I'll go had long had long dissolved. A lot of people moved back to Ireland um, during, you know, the uh, later 90s, early 2000s, when there was a decent economy for a change in Ireland. A lot of people moved back. People moved all over the country. And um, officially, I'll go kind of finished up as an official group trying to get into the parade after about 12 years. But there was another group called Irish Queers who had, you know, had been in Ilgo and then invited new people who, who turned up at the parade every single year to protest, every single year. And then there was an alternative parade um, started in Queens called um, uh, same paths for all. So it was mostly that group that got invited in 25 years later into the main parade on Fifth Avenue, along with some people who had been in Ilgo who were still in this in the city. Um, yeah, so I mean it was people were protesting it for the whole 25 years. Yeah. But not the same people often. Well, some of the same. Hmm? 
Were you still involved at the end? No. I mean, I would, I would um, come to the Irish queers protests every, every couple of years uh, and stand on the sidelines. But I, you know, I found the whole thing kind of depressing. And by then I did not want to be in the St. Patrick's Day parade. I couldn't have cared less about it. Um, uh, yeah, so it left a bad taste in my mouth. I mean, it, it was not a, the Irish community in New York um, really let us down and um, totally betrayed us, left us on our own completely. Um, people who didn't have to, organizations that didn't have to do that did. Um, and eventually the organizers of the parade only allowed a gay group in because Guinness were threatening to pull their sponsorship as well as the Ford Motor Company and NBC Four were saying, we're not going to televise the parade anymore. So it wasn't out of the goodness of their hearts that they let the queers in. It was because they felt they had to financially for their, for their parade to continue. Um, Interest, yeah. once again. Totally. So um, by the time that happened, I couldn't have cared less about the St. Patrick's Day Parade. It was a major victory, of course, after all those years. It absolutely was. So um, I, I'm very glad that other people, other Irish queer people were, were happy to march in the parade. And you were involved with the uh, Avengers during this whole period. Yes, and you know, so with, with the Lesbian Avengers and I'll Go and a full-time job, I kind of had a lot of push and pull. So I would withdraw from Avenger to focus on I'll Go and then every once in a while go back in and, you know, do an action with the Avengers. Yeah, it was, it was a very busy time. The 90s were kind of fantastic, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. um, and you work at NYU. Are you st you're still working? Yes, I work at NYU. I'm in uh, the School of Professional Studies. I work in um, arts and humanities as a you know an office office worker. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you were involved with uh, Barbara Hammer's history lessons. You did yes. a huge amount of research for that. Yeah, well, in a previous lifetime, I uh, worked for Rick Prelinger, who has a fantastic um, archival collection. Um, and through him, I ended up becoming an archival film researcher and did it for quite a long time. And in his collection, I noticed when I'd be looking for material for a whole other project or um, I started to see all these images that said lesbian to me and, and after a while I started editing them. You know, I would take the clip out of something, note what it came from, when it was made and put it on a separate tape. And then I did say it to Rick, I said, you know, I'm doing this. Um, do you mind? It's obviously not a film about lesbians. It's got nothing to do. Like, for example, a US Army film called The Army Nurse from the 1940s. And I just saw images of lesbians everywhere in that. So I would just take the clips that read lesbian to me. And I ended up with a reel of uh, lesbian imagery. Uh, and um, I was trying to shop it around to lesbian filmmakers for a long time. And then eventually there was a moment that happened where I think Sue Friedrich saw it and used some of it and Mary Paterno used some of it. And also Barbara Hammer used a lot of it in history lessons. So um, the great part about that was Barbara Hammer cast me as the ghostly archivist in, in that film, which was a, a total blast. And that is actually Prelinger archive where, you know, I'm kind of floating through like this um, archivist ghost in that movie. So that was a lot of fun and just great to get that, that those images out, out there, you know? 
You're a Renaissance person, Anne. Oh yeah, I'm lucky. I think I've been very lucky. Um, you know, meeting the people I met uh, on on this journey. Yeah, I've had a lot of interesting and in interesting people. Well, let's talk about Rock the Sham, your account of the uh, Irish gay and lesbian group and the struggle about the St. Patrick's Day Parade. As I said, it was published in 2006. And I read all the reviews and they, they're really, they say it's funny and informative. They really raved about it. So I encourage the audience to get it. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, Rock the Sham. I mean, I think I wrote about three different versions of, of that book, some heavily uh, involved in all the legal battles. I mean, we had constitute, we had, you know, local, state, um, federal, Supreme Court, and I became extremely interested in the constitution and was fascinated by, by the law. So I, I think I wrote a book, a Rock the Sham version with the law. I wrote one that had everything in it that was far too long. And this, this version felt like uh, um, a very tight version of what happened, which of course is much more readable. Um, so highly edited, more readable, which tells the basic story of, uh, of what happened in a two year period really, which, you know, um, at least I wrote it much later, so I was able to go back and say what had happened since. Um, yeah, I, I think mostly um, writing it felt, felt like an activist uh, decision because lesbians are always completely wiped out of the picture. Um, women are always wiped out of the picture. And I thought somewhere, this is a record and, and even, and it has gotten lost. I mean, people do talk about the St. Patrick's Day Parade and the gays and the whole, you know, what really happened is kind of lost. Um, and also because uh, the group, the workers in the group were for the most part lesbians. Um, so the, the creativity, the labor, the fantastic ideas um, and, and the determination uh, was was mostly lesbians and um, and and a few gay men. Um, some of those gay men have also been erased, which is kind of interesting. Um, so in some ways, this was like here is a record. Here are the people who were involved, uh, and somewhere, if I can put it in a few archives. Hopefully, you know, it, it can get dug up when it needs to be dug up for people who want the story. It's a valuable record. And mm -hmm. as you say, a lot of it gets lost. So you're to be commended for writing that book. And, you know, I haven't written a book ever, but I imagine it's quite an undertaking. So yeah. persistence and um, yeah. stamina. One more question. You have written things throughout your life. Most recently, you contributed to Sinister Wisdom 113, the dump Trump issue. Um, so as you're doing all your activism, you're also recording it. And you know that issue, I tried to get your article and it sold out. Oh, OK. Um, well, that, yeah, that was a revolting lesbians and it was uh, it was, uh, they wanted to use uh, pictures, they wanted photographs of our actions over, um, I think about a year. And we were, we formed because we wanted, uh, uh, we, we formed because we wanted to work on following the money. We weren't that interested in focusing solely on Trump. Um, he was just the culmination, the vile culmination of stuff that's been going on here since, um, I think, Ronald Reagan. Um, and we wanted a campaign 
So something that we could win in, um, was very important to us. And we also wanted to follow the money. So we put a lot of research in and came upon uh, Rebecca Mercer, who's a massive donor to Republicans and right-wing causes, climate change denier, funded Breitbart, um, Cambridge Analytica, that whole Facebook scandal, um, is now running parlor, but put a huge amount of money into climate science denial. Um, uh, a lot of right, anything like that's really disgusting, the Mercers are involved. And she's also on the board of the American Museum of Natural History, a science museum. And we thought this is perfect. This is her, the one board she's actually sitting on that makes her kind of legitimate in the decent world. Everything else, it's, it's all the right wing, right wing people. She doesn't belong in the decent world on the board of the American Museum of Natural History. And we thought this is it. This is where we're going to focus to try and have them shove her out. She's funding climate science denial. What is she doing sitting on your board? Um, so the Avenger, our, the revolting lesbians, that was our focus. And then we kind of, you know, we got involved in other stuff that was going on. Um, when Mariella Franco, the Brazilian councilwoman was assassinated, we worked with the Brazilian community here. Um, that was such a tragedy. Oh my God, really awful. Um, we also worked, um, with uh, lesbians in Chile um, because they have a history the last 10, 15 years of butch dykes been murdered uh, um, uh, and the police and the state not following up and not taking it seriously. Um, we worked, you know, we did the climate march and the the first action we were supposed to have was at the American Museum of Natural History. And then the Women's March was the day before that. And it was also at a time when four black lesbians had been murdered, one in DC, two in upstate New York, and one with her daughter in Florida. So we felt, okay, we're changing our first action. It's about these lesbians who've just been murdered at the Women's March. So, you know, we had our focus on our campaign, but we were very happy to, to join in, in other stuff that was going on in the city and the, the country. Well, Anne, the time has flown by. We'll have to have you come back and yeah. talk in greater detail. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me on. I'm very, very happy that you, you invited me to participate in your show. It's fantastic. You'll have to come again. Okay, thank you, Anne. Thank you for joining us. And until next time, remember, resist.